Hey everybody, this is Perch, and I want to talk to you for a moment about a topic that I, I it's not going to get the hits. It's not going to get a bunch of attention, but I, I wish it would, and I can't tell you exactly why, but just, just bear with me here on this one. The, tr tr trust me, this is one you'll want to, to, to just put in that memory bank for yourself, and just, just let's see how the rest of the year plays out, okay? Cool. So back in the 80s, there was this imprint at Marvel called Star, Star Comics, and it, it started in 1984, and it was really all about kids. Uh, it was aimed at child readers. It was what we call today all ages. It would be the equivalent of Dogman and, and stuff like that that you see uh, doing quite well, um, but it was also heavy licensing. So it was really focused on uh, TV series, toys, uh, things that uh, basically Marvel was licensing to do books off of. One of the ones that people probably remember the most was the Ewoks series that was uh, was part of this line, but things like Alf was there, Account Ducula, Defenders of the Earth, uh, Fraggle Rock, Heathcliff, Inhumanoids, hey, how about that, 80s kids, Inhumanoids, uh, there was Brief Masters of the Universe book, there were Muppet Babies, there was Silverhawks, that was another, I love Silverhawks, uh, by the way, just as a... As an aside, as a cartoon in the late 80s, I thought it was it was great. I just, uh, I really like that title. Um, in, in hindsight now, as a, as a grown man, I've gone back and looked at it, and it's, it's, it's terrible. But, you know, <laughs> the, the, the kid, um, you know, this, this early teenager, I'm like, ah, oh, that's some cool stuff. Toys were cool. Anyway, uh, they did the Star Wars droids comic. Uh, uh, Thundercats was there, Visionaries, a lot of kind of stuff like that. And then they also had some original titles. Uh, most notably is probably Peter Porker, uh, the Spectacular Spider-Ham, which ran for about about three years. You had Misty, you had uh, Top Dog, you had um, uh, Wally the Wizard. Anyway, a lot of books like this. And uh, this was, you know, it was it was an imprint. It lasted not long, uh, four four years total. And uh, Tom DeFalco was one of the the drivers of all this. Sid Jacobson was the editor. And the other kind of unique part about it was that they specified for the beginning that it was all ages titles, titles for, for kids, young adults, um, but that they would be exploring humor, romance, uh, adventure, superhero books, and licensed properties. And they made kind of a big deal about uh, the fact that they would publish romance, and they would publish humor, and they would publish adventure. And it, it, it was... Uh, it, it was important that they do that. Um, this was, you know, arguably at the time they were trying to attack uh, Archie a little bit, who had a, a bit of a, they were making some moves in the newsstand, especially at grocery stores and other things. They were getting preferential treatment of placement of titles. Um, some of that was what led Archie to do a lot of the digest, but they were basically, Archie was carving out this place of we are the safe comics. And they were not, they were not saying that out to everybody, but they were saying it to uh, to the newsstand, you know, they were they were pushing that. Hey, um, you know, you, there's lots of comics everywhere. The direct market was would would kind of come to be a little bit later, and they were saying this is the these are the titles that are that are trusted that parents can be safe for kids, and it was an important strategy uh, for distribution at the time because they were trying to get comics more places. They were going to expand the market, and one of the ways to do that was to convince parents, hey, here's something. Uh, comfortable and safe and good that you can you can buy for your kids. So they were attacking that a gold key was going out. They had a ton of licensed properties. Suddenly a bunch of stuff was up for business, and so Marvel said, you know, we we need to go for this, and they they put a plan in place. Um, Jim Shooter arguably uh, kind of initiated this idea, but. He you know, self-admitted that he wasn't an expert on this line. This is why he had Tom DeFalco to coordinate and kind of push this stuff. And there would be a there'd be a number of kind of odd moments in all this stuff. But um, it was it, it was arguably success. It was successful, but it was kind of a hidden success. So what it did do successfully was it it basically put a big block in front of Archie and some uh, some other efforts at the time which were trying to corner in on kind of this entry to comics market. Marvel was able to go in and do this and kind of put a foot in the door. And then with things like, uh, ultimately they, you know, they, they would, 
uh, go on to do Secret Wars, a lot of toy licensing, and they would do other things that kind of leveraged off this. And as it turned out, things like Secret Wars wound up getting a lot more attention. In, you know, then you, while the, the Star Comics were in the early stages of planning, Secret Wars wound up doing, doing good. The, uh, the Marvel lineup wound up feeling pretty successful. And so suddenly this idea that we're going to license stuff was, you know, they had the X-Men and they had Spider-Man and they had their own products. You know, suddenly things like uh, Visionaries and Silverhawks, I mean, you know, Spider-Man's better. So I think some of the attention kind of uh, went away at that point. Uh, the Star Wars stuff, they had a Star Wars comic, so it was, uh, it was seen as less useful. Um, it was, uh, you know, a, the, and then they, it was a nice throwback to Millie the model with Misty the model. And, and that was, uh, that was kind of clever and everything else. But ultimately, um, you know, the, the, the brand kind of dissolved as Marvel while they were starting it up, they figured out that they could have success in other areas. Um, but it was, it, it did its job. I, I guess the best way to say it is it did its job. It did its job so quickly that they didn't need to kind of keep it alive. Meaning it, it, people, they, they successfully kind of locked in Marvel as, a, as a brand that could appeal to kids and could appeal to this younger audience without needing the star piece. So they, they wind up dissolving the titles. They kind of go back and they have Marvel, uh, as a thing. They discover that, um, kind of their, their team, the kind of the YA market were really into their existing titles maybe, you know, the sensibilities were changing as well. In the early 80s, there was, I think, more concern about the content that kids were reading. And in the late 80s, kids were uh, kind of had aged up a little bit. Content that wouldn't might not be appropriate. I mean, <laughs> case in point, uh, Craven's Last Hunt was something that was very popular with the, you know, the 14 to 18 set. Now, Craven's Last Hunt featured, you know, suicide and hallucinations and spider monsters everywhere and all this stuff. I mean, you, you wouldn't, you wouldn't call that a, a dogman level all ages story, but back in the late eighties, it, it kind of, it fit that bill. There were very young readers reading that and enjoying it. And you know, it, it was what it was. Marvel never got hit with a uh, kind of another seduction of the innocent style <laughs> scandal, but it, it worked for them in today's day and age. That would be trickier, even though we're a you know, it's a very different society. Times are very changed and everything else, but it, it just, it wouldn't be the same. So why do I take you through the star history? I can't say, but it would be good to remember it. So <laughs> I guess that's, that's the best I can, I can put. Um, it is interesting to consider, and I think this is the best I can, I can give is that, you know, at the time, when this was, uh, when this kicked off and these books, none of, the, none of the books were amazing. All the books were fairly shallow, uh, certainly in how they were put together and what they did. They weren't, uh, none of these were, were stories for the ages, but they provided simple entertainment. I think they, they, as I mentioned, they were a successful gateway drug. Uh, I, that's not the best term, but it's one we're going to use. They were a successful gateway drug into getting comics into kids' hands and getting uh, people to kind of age up into these different properties. It did its job. And so I think that if you look at the today's market and you look at what Scholastic has done, and you look at kind of the progress at YA and all ages and all that kind of stuff is done, then you see how this, uh, you see why the challenge that they were facing in the early 80s is kind of another one today, especially with uh, some of the big markets kind of making big inroads against the number one publisher, the defense that the publisher did to take it back. So that's, that's a little history for you, something to kind of check out and, and, uh, pay attention to. And, um, you know, it's always good to get comics to kids. Who's, who's, how are you doing? Good. You know, what, what were you off doing? Playing with my friend. Oh, that's good. Okay. See, were you reading comic books? Uh, we were playing outside and looking for frogs. Okay. That's, that's not, that's not reading comic books. And I found a golf ball. Oh yeah. What, what color was it? White. Okay, there you go. So uh, <laughs> the, the challenge of getting kids to read comic books continues, uh, but these kinds of efforts certainly make sense if you think about growing the overall market. You know what's in your house? You know what's in your house right now? I got you the new book of Dogman. It's in your room. Did you know that there's a new one? No. Are you excited? Yeah. Okay. You want to go and check it out? Oh, and she's off. All right. There you go. Hey, everybody, like and subscribe, and thanks for listening.